So welcome everyone. I see you're all coming in to the webinar. Um, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. It's a little icon at the very bottom of your screens. Um, I'm Lindsay, I'm AAVSO's Communications Manager, and thank you all so much for joining us for our webinar today. Um, Gabriel Nagu is a AAVSO ambassador. He, so he does a lot of outreach for us and a lot of education. And so I'm really happy you're joining us today. And he, of course, is joined by Sebastian Otero, who is our VSX expert extraordinaire. I'm going to check everything Gabriel says in this webinar. So Gabriel, be careful. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. If you're just coming in, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat if you like. It's that little icon at the bottom of your screen and you're just gonna set it to send to all panelists and attendees and that way everyone knows who you are, where you're from, just an option. I see we already have 64 participants, nice attendance. We can wait a couple of minutes to see if more people join in. What I also thought. Ah, apparently chat is disabled. Hmm. Is disabled? Mm, let me check. Let me check. Okay, started it. Oh, okay. Yep, we're working on enabling chat. Yes, all good, Robert. Thank you. Finland and SLU, awesome. We love SLU. Oh, Abu Dhabi. Oh my, wow. Abu Dhabi. Romania. Everyone from all over. Ukraine, Catalonia, France, Exeter, New Hampshire. I know Exeter, New Florida. Mexico, Texas. We have many people from Romania. I think Gabriel has a fans club there. Yeah. <laughs> He's one of our rising stars. Ooh, new VSX volunteer, thank yeah, you. Yeah, Jim Bidiant. He's working hard these days. And he's a very good volunteer. I have a lot of hope put on oh, him. Oh, I, so. I saw the revisions. Yep. 3 a.m. Yeah. in Melbourne, wow. <laughs> London, Colombia. Ukraine, Colombia. Egypt. Colombia. Nice to see someone from South America. Oh, we've had cloudy skies since October, yeah. Bogdan says. In Romania. Wow. Egypt, every everywhere. Okay. Incredible. For those of you just joining us, we're just gonna start in just a minute. We're just allowing everyone to just get situated into the webinar. Um, feel free to say hello in the chat. And we're so glad to have you join us today. It looks like there are many people interested in how to report a new variable star. Mm. It's That's complicated, nice. I hear. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, let's see what Gabriel has to say. Yeah, I'm gonna talk from my experience. Is it complicated or not? Florida, Gabriel? Russia, Colorado. Not really. <laughs> it's just gonna be very Filipino. Patient. Maryland. Oh, the Philippines. Germany, Greece. Greece. Ooh, the Ozarks. All right, it's 11.05, so do we want to get started? Yeah, I think we should start it. Yeah, yeah I think the number of attendees is stabilized now, so we can do it. So if anyone has questions for Sebastian or Gabriel, um, 
please ask them through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, we won't necessarily see them in the chat, so um, please use that Q&A button to ask your questions. All right, and I'll pass it off to Sebastian and Gabriel. Yeah, so I guess we're gonna start it. I hope you all see my screen. Yes, it's fine. Yeah, so as you are told, it's gonna be about uh, how to report your astronomical discoveries with AVSO. To start, the variable star index is a very big, big uh, variable star catalog where each day new variable stars are added and revisions of the older ones are done. Uh, this number is bigger with one because I forgot to update it. So, for example, this week, 32, 33 new objects have been added. And this was shown by querying the VSX with the new special search method I saw just one hour ago. And as you see, this interface is very simple to use to search for the variable stars. You can search by name, by constellation, or even uh, do a more elaborate search where you can start, start searching for stars easy to observe for you by the variability type, spectral type, position in the sky, constellation, uh, the period, you can choose a shorter period one, a longer period one, or, um, or even no way. You can see the, the outburst here. Uh, as you see, this special search method enables you to see stars added uh, this week, this month, or um, cataclysmic variables added in the the next, uh, the next, the, the previous, the earliest, uh, yeah, ten years. Uh, what I want to see, to show here, as you see, the variability type and the order by are in a in a red um, rectangle. Here, I wanted to talk about revising the database for beginners. Like this is what I first done after. Um, reporting my first variable star with after a lot of hard work because I wasn't really used to the reporting. I started searching for variable stars, simple variable stars, stars eclipsing binaries, like <laughs> these were the easiest to analyze for me. And if you use this query, e, EW or EA or any type of variable star, and you order them by period, First time is gonna show you the variable stars with no calculated period. So you can use the survey available data to search for them and analyze their period, their amplitudes. Here is the result from the query uh, I did just uh, one hour ago. So these first stars have no calculated period and some of them don't even have the range, the well-defined range. Those, the CZEV, were extracted from the check catalog. First, to revise the variable stars or to discover, you need to use available survey data if you want to do data mining. And VTF is the easiest I could uh, ever use. It's an automated survey offering time series data in the filters G, R, and I. Um, the I filter doesn't have a lot of data yet. That's the reference we use in the, um, the VSX when we, do, when we do updates or submissions. This is my first uh, revision to a known variable star. As I showed you, I was searching for, first time when I started, I was searching for uh, eclipsing binaries. And this star, GI Andromeda, which is an RRAB type, uh, was classified as an EW. But when I downloaded the, the data and analyzed it, it was shown to be an RRAB star. And I analyzed, you show here, the type, range, uh, airport, period and rise duration with a lot of help from uh, Sebastian. 
and no, noticed even something I, sh I saw for the first time, that the pulsating variables have different amplitude in different filters. Uh, as you see, the redder the filter, the smaller the amplitude. Assassin is another survey, very easy to use, and the data is very easy to, um, to extract. It has data in D and G filters, and here is the, the reference we're using. That's another curve I, I did and submitted to the ADSL. I revised the type, range, period, and epoch, and rise duration for this star NSV7186, which was specified as an RR, but unsure. And now I want to talk about the reporting of an invariable star. But before that, I want to switch to the, um, to the VSX link to show some uh, new stuff. Just let me switch my screen share. Uh, this is the VSX homepage, which shows how much, how many variable stars are in the catalog right now. And here are down, I don't know if you see it, the different menus we can use before reporting. The, more, the most important ones being the validity types and the frequently asked questions. Uh, this uh, manual shows all the types, the variable stars including in, in the VSX with their uh, descriptions. So whenever you have a variable star, you discover one and you analyze the data, you're gonna get a period, a range, and you're gonna compare them to to this um, to this guideline. So you're gonna know exactly what variable star you have. Uh, my discoveries consist of eclipsing binaries, uh, even rotating ones like the ACV, the DI draconis, the TPS rotative, and also pulsating ones and the cat placement ones. I, I think I have almost all the types. Also, this um, this link shows you another very important method, a very important uh, very important stuff about the reporting, and it tells you basically almost all the questions you're gonna have uh, regarding the discovery credit data mining in different services, even even for uh, reporting uh, a submission or a new variable, and all the references you can use. And also information about the past band and the transformation shift to use. Also here, it tells you how to do the, do the remarks like the remarks in the VSX are, uh, all, almost all of them are standard standardized. And also a short manual for the submissions. And with very important stuff, like when I started, I didn't knew most of those. So I'd made a lot, a lot of mistakes. And uh, I had to read the manuals a lot of times to learn it. Also, the supporting documents. If you have a periodic variable, you give a phase plot or a JD light curve or your regular one, like the cat place mix. And some, even a finder chart, if it's a crowded field. All the past 10 views are uh, here in this link. 
So whenever you use a passband, it should it's better to use the DVR passband. The the V the V band data is preferred to every variable. But most of the times you're not gonna have this. You're gonna have the slow on R from the ZPF or or slow on G or even our other filters depend on the um, on your observation. For example, different surveys reported their variable the their variable stars magnitude in different filters. Like Atlas used the Cyan filter. Uh, Hipparchos used the HIPOB, V, HIPOV, and R. The Galax survey has the NUV as them. Atlas has even an O, O band. Uh, regarding the special searches, I now want to show them uh, as an example. This new object in the last week is a very new multi query and shows you the um, all the stars that were added in the last week. Uh, personally, I think this one is the most interesting. I saw it, I think, this morning, and I see it's a co discovery. It was uh, updated since I saw it. And basically, it shows two variable types, uh, EA and STB type. Here it shows the EA variation. And in this phase plot, the SPB variation with a period of 0 0.6315 days. All the variable star periods are reported in days. And the epoch, as shown here, is in HGD, the heliocentric Julian date. Another variable star, interesting variable star discovery I, um, I saw was, let me see where it is. I think that's it. Yeah. This variable star is a possible UGSU found by some of my collaborate, collaborators from the US. They run a survey with a RASA telescope and I, I don't see the curve here. Uh, but first, it was reported to the TNS by them. Um, you know, most of the surveys report the cataclysmic variables first to the TNS, and then they have to be migrated to the VSA. Uh, this, one, this one was added 10 minutes ago. So this yeah. is actually a real time talk. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that's why my uh, data in the presentation was a little wrong by one. <laughs> um, it was let me add. Let, yeah. let me add that we added the new new stars uh, since last login option because uh, some people were thinking that uh, the changes since last login only included new objects. And no, uh, there were new and known variables there. Just every change that was made in the last week was was there. So now we have the the new objects option to to discriminate between the two the two types. So. Actually, it's a very useful stuff. Yeah, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I was very happy to see it. Another program, interesting program for beginners, is finding the the eclipsing, the offending eclipsing binary, which are a lot of Kel stars. If you, Sebastian, if you want to tell us anything about it. Well, that was a list of uh, false positives uh, found by the Kel survey. Uh, false positive means that uh, they were first thought to be transiting planets, but uh, they were actually eclipsing binaries, uh, who, which are close to a bright companion. So the photometry is blended. And the thing is that they got the, the wrong star as the variable. So now we are including a lot of wrong positions here, wrong identifications. And this project is, is meant to to help us identify the, the actual variable star, who is usually 
several arc seconds, actually even arc minutes away from the current position. So uh, I think it's a, it's a good project for, for new people. Um, there are a lot of stars that have a remark. You can see here in, in the right, in, the, in Gabriel's screen, that uh, we have a remark indicating the position angle and the distance in arc seconds from the, the current position of the pos potential actual variable star. So the project is meant to, to find the current variable and, uh, and to confirm the, the elements, the period uh, and the epoch, uh, and give a, a much better range because now we are including only a, a blended range, a very small amplitude when the actual variable, the eclipsing binary is likely to have a, a much lar larger amplitude. So uh, this is a good project. I know, uh, Gabriel, you want to be part of it. And uh, I just told you, wait a minute before <laughs> to, to see if anybody else w w was interested and I help us. And we have, uh, we have had uh, four people so far interested, which is, which is a lot, speaking of VSX projects. So um, it's a very successful project. So if you want to, to join and tell us our, your experience, uh, that would be that would be great. Yeah, there I are one of my collaborators from uh, Yash City, in Romania. I think he contacted you about it. Ah, okay. Maybe he he should be one of those four people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. His name is Daniel. There are several data mining projects in the VSX page, um, but uh, this one is 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 the most recent one. Uh, other stuff I want to show you are the Nova discovery. Uh, and I think Sebastian can correct me if I'm, uh, if I'm wrong. These variable stars are reported only with the discoverer's data. Yes, some people may not be able or may not have the time to combine data from different surveys. So uh, they can submit your findings anyway, your discoveries, but uh, we flag them as novice discoveries so other people may then come back to those stars and do a more deep, a deeper analysis, combining data from different surveys and improve the elements. Because as you see, if you take a look at the periods here, at the period column, you will see that the periods are very rough, very approximate. So they need some improvement. So this is uh, another project for someone who was who want to to improve this information here. Yeah, this is a project I approached some time ago when one of the uh, Romanian discoverers found a variable star, uh, exactly this star. You know, it's, it's working. It's working harder. The VSX is, is working harder when you're logged in. I don't know why. Yeah, most of the time happens. Yeah, some unpredictable things with the lo login happens usually. <laughs> we don't know what they are, but several people have some kind of trouble sometimes. Yeah, and to compare the plot, this, this is the discoverer's plot, and this is the assassin and ZPF plot. And as you see here, let me open the discoverer's plot again. The period here from the period determined here is very different. This one being much more precise. Can you show the plot again? Okay, my plot? The... Yeah, yes, it was just to, to mention something. It's important that when you upload a, a supporting document like a face plot, you plot phase zero uh, as, uh, I mean, phase zero should be a time of maximum for a pulsating variable or a time of minimum, uh, a primary eclipse for an eclipse in binary, not just a random phase, because uh, this is something that sometimes people don't, don't know and just submit a plot with random phases. And it's good to, for us to see uh, that the epoch that you are reporting in the table is shown as phase zero, zero here because it's a way to, to see, okay, the, 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 the term in the book is it's, it's okay, it's correct. So just that. And this way it also helps the, the observers to make any errors. Exactly, that's the point because if you just give a random epoch, uh, the ephemeris will give 
any results. So any planning would be possible. Uh, the, the key here is to, to, to be able to reproduce an epoch of minimum or maximum. So you're going to observe specifically at that time. So yes. And these are, this search, the, um, your own contributions shows people the contributions you have. And this contains even your variable star report as well as the, um, as other reports. Like if I submit a variable discovered by someone else, it still appears here as my contribution. And then you see the GI and the Ramada. And how many variable stars have you found since you started? Mm, let me do, do this query. And uh, it would be interesting to know uh, how long have you been discovering variable stars? Yeah. When was your first one? Uh, I think, actually, let me read it from here. Oh, okay, you, you will see the date, yeah. Yeah, I think at the beginning of the year. So I have less than one year if I'm doing this. That's an amazing career in variable stars, really. Yeah, yeah you're a rising star, yeah. <laughs> and I found some really interesting ones, like one in uh, the M17 nebula, the G20. I don't know how I... This one is in the M M17 nebula. I know if you... Again, as I said, when I'm logged in, it works a little bit harder. One thing we, we need to mention is that it's important that everybody reads the VSX manual before attempting to, to make a submission because uh, there are a lot of details and tips that you will find there, not only the FAQ and the guidelines, uh, if you are going to report something, please first read the manual. It, it's important. I know it's a little long, 80 pages or so, but um, you will find a lot of examples and things that uh, you will be used when you are first in front of your the VSX form there. So um, it's important for us because if not, um, it takes too much time to, to explain how to fill each field individually to every person who is uh, asking for, for that information. So we, we try to, to have this material available to everyone. So uh, all these questions are minimized and you have all the information in one, one place. So take your time and do it. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> I think even this part is very important. Is your object variable? If you remember my first Two reports or three were non variable. Don't, don't ask me that. I can't remember, but please tell yeah. us. <laughs> yeah. The first three variable stars I reported were non variable ones. And I don't know why I saw them as variable. The lack of experience, maybe. And now the star is loaded. So that's when I reported the first variable. I think that that's the month, right? Yeah. So on the fourth month of 2021, or no? Yeah, that's it. When I reported the first variable star. And was, Sorry, um, you, you reported your first variable star during the pandemic? Yeah, that's when I started. For me, it has been years. I thought it, it has been years. OK, OK. <laughs> uh, and it was a Myra type. Because after I reported those bad looking variables, like not the non variables, I was tired of looking for small variabilities and started looking for uh, higher amplitude, like the minor. Uh, let me see. Here, it was discovered with my mentor, Gabriel, the other Gabriel, Sandin, a collaborator from the US. And Dominic is um, a member of the um, astronomy club here in Mexico. Uh, I think do you want to go forward with the submission now? 
Okay. Okay. So, for beginners, this, the new star wizard, is the best method to use. Uh, do you want me to use this one? Or? You can. Yeah. You only have one star to submit. Um, yeah. I usually use the new star format. It's up to you. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to use this one. Um, I have, let me check, a list of coordinates here. I mean, my, uh, the coordinates for the report. So this will be a live presentation of how to submit a variable and it will be reviewed in real time. So you will be seeing a change in, in the VSX database uh, happening right now. Yeah. So these are the coordinates, but as always, I need to check them to see if this is the real star I'm not reporting. Here I'm using Aladdin and the fast starts images. And yes, that's the star. I remember the image. And these are this these are the guy the, the EDR3 coordinates. So I have to go here and type Gaia EDR3 position to know which position it is. The Gaia is the best position, like Gaia EDR3. Yes, we didn't update the, the VSX manual um, documentation, but uh, we have still still have Gaia DR2. But every time a new release is available, it's better to use the, the latest one. So this one is OK. Um, I think this one's my 57 star, but I have to check that. So I use this check name. And again, it's working a little bit hard. Yes, you can't report a star if, if it's already in the database, if the name is already in BSS. Oh, yeah, it is here. So it's going to be 58. Uh, Have you we, clicked on the spot check option? Yeah, and oh. uh, it showed me the 57 variable. Hey, OK, sorry. In, in the meantime, we can select the type. It's an UG type. Uh, let me get here. Oh, yeah, it's 58. And let me put in the discount. You, you, can you can show your light curve to see why is, yeah. is it a G UG type. I need to upload it first. Here. Uh, I'm using ah, the yeah. method uh, supporting file one. So the title should be JD plot if it's a JD plot, and the description I'm using JD plot with ZTF and yes one data or like this. And let me use this submini star using the draft to so mark as a draft first. So I can open the image. That's the JD plot of the variable star. You're right, I plotted it using ZTF, R data, and PS1 in G, R, and I. And gave the range in the highest range here in G band, the black dot here and here. Um, the maxima is 16.7. For this kind of stars, you should give uh, just one decimal for the for the experiment. And then I select the band used, in this case, G Sloan. Uh, it has no period, no epoch, no rise duration, no outburst here. This is yeah, uh, above the range, uh, if the amplitude is large and the variable is irregular, like any UG type, uh, it doesn't make sense to give more decimal places because any every outburst will be different. So. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be more precise. So 
like for the BSCT. I, I remember I gave, gave even uh, three decimals for that one. Uh, now, uh, that is, I have discovered now the other names I should give. Uh, I only found it in Gaia EDR3. And I'm also giving this name because it's um, a co discovery with Marius Bayer, a collaborator. Uh, he helped me analyzing and doing the plot because I don't really know how to extract the fun start data. I'm looking, and it looks a little bit different. Uh, the reference name I'm giving here, I also have them saved. You always have to give the reference for, for your data, in this case, one stars and GPS. Uh, and also I'm pressing it again as a graph. To give the other uh, reference for, for the GPS. And after, that's the, the thing I learned from my mentor. After you do the report, you have to verify it again. Like the name, the position, the type, make sure you type everything in order, like it should be. If you update the, the good place plot, one time I updated the wrong one, or the JD plot. Other names, the discover names have to be complete and the references. Yeah, I, I remember that sometimes you, you mixed up the the light course and you sent a light course from the previous start you have discovered. Yeah. So this can happen. It's not a huge I problem, a, but a you, you have to keep that in mind. Yeah. Yeah, but now I'm verifying it. Everything. <laughs> and I guess that's all. I should submit the right? Do and what you I, want. Yeah. Yeah, do, do it. If something is wrong, you will know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you receive a, in, an email application. So after you verify everything, you just uh, press here and the submit changes. And it goes to the reviewer. And I got it. So yeah. if you want me to share my screen, yeah, you just, will be able to see um, how the moderation process is how we review Gabriel's submission. Yeah, I stopped my uh, share screen. Okay, so I now received, can you see it? Yeah, I see it. Okay, I now received the VSX notification telling me that the new star NGCA V58 had been submitted by Gabriel. So now I will click on this link. And I'm here in the moderation interface. I see all the information Gabriel entered in the VSX form. It looks fine. Okay, discoverer, the range. To see if this range matches what he saw, I will check in the supporting documentation. I see here we have a GD, JD plot. I will click on that and I will see it. Okay, 16, 16.7, oops. Mm. Mm. This looks like 16.8, not seven. <laughs> if I'm going in, into too much detail, I would ask you to check this magnitude. <laughs> But uh, 21.7, yes. We have two outbursts here, so it's definitely a new G, uh, a dwarf nova. Uh, designations, the references are fine. So this is, uh, this is okay. So I can now proceed here to set the 
to change the status of the of the submission to approved. If something was wrong, um, I would click on the reviewing option. So Gabriel would be able to edit this form and change what is what it's needed to be changed. Um, if something is really, really wrong, for instance, if this variable tur turns out to be already known, we have uh, these two options, check nearby to see if something is, is around the variable uh, or at the same position. And uh, no, there's nothing. There's just a, a ZTF variable two arc minutes away. So this is not known. I was scared for a moment when I saw the, the star. Yeah, we have a, a large search radius, but uh, you have to see that these are arc minutes, so no, no issue. And um, if it had turned out to be known, I would have rejected the submission and tell Gabriel that this was a known variable, but it's not the case. So what I do now is to flag it as approved and just click on the assign button and we have a new variable star here. If I go to the, the changes since last login option, I now see that the latest, latest addition was NGCA v58. So it's now live in the database. Here we have all the information now available to everyone. So that was a success. I will stop sharing my screen now so you can continue with your talk. Well, as you saw, the process is pretty easy if you know the steps. Like, you should always use the, the guidelines. Yes, you have to get used to the process. Once you get used, it's not uh, really hard, but you have to know that there are procedures, requirements, standards that you have to follow. That's that's the thing. You don't. You have to be patient. There's a learning curve. You have to go through all the process. Take your time. Uh, as Gabriel said at the beginning, it will be hard. You may you will make mistakes, but uh, if you read all the documentation, there will be less mistakes. So just read everything and take your time. We will help you. It's not that we are not going to help you. We are here to help you. So. Um, that's fine, but keep in mind that it's not just uh, give a, a magnitude and that's it, it's a variable star. We need support in documentation. We need you to follow some guidelines. So this is science after all. Yeah, it has to be precise. And here it's 51, it was 50 when we started. And I would also like to show some variable stars discovered by me in uh, in a team, but I see the query doesn't work. Yeah, uh, some stars here are these stars are reported by the Gaga Astronomical Observatory, and the latest one and the most interesting one is this one. I see a lot of <laughs> names I didn't add. Uh, it's a five, around 5.2 five max star. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I, I will, just a comment. You have the Simbar option available uh, through your preferences. You have a, you can set them up off if you want because it takes a little more time to load the pages when you have that option activated. But if you have to, to get all the names of a star, you can use that option. But you can turn it on and off. It's it's de it depends on your likes. Yeah, uh, that's uh, the SCT variable star. Um, we calculated the distance using the Gaia EDR3 parallax and the period. Uh, the photometry for this one was made in Astro Image J. I see this image is a little bit too big. For uh, and we observe it in V and V data. But since this is a very bright star, we use the Hipparcos data as, um, uh, how is it called? The zero point. Yeah. Also, the spectral type 
was taken from a catalog, which we credited here. Um, I think that's all about, about this one. And that's another interesting star that many of you don't know the story behind it. Uh, it's a variable star discovered at the Gaia Astronomical Observatory. And first time when they saw it, they uh, there weren't a lot of catalogs available, I think in 2014, and a lot of uh, available survey data. So it was reported as a, um, as a NOVA to the, to the seabed. And after that, someone from the observatory decided to report it to the VSX in case it's a variable star, long period one. And in the past year, or I think even in 2020, I don't, I don't really remember, uh, me and the other ones, the, the new crew. You, you can check on the star uh, page and see the revision history and you will see all the changes with the dates yeah. they were made. So you can do that and yeah, this will not, reveal the, the star history. It's a, a little bit, uh, the software doesn't really work because that was locked in. Okay, here it is. So it was in 2017, but I think it's an older discovery from, I can check the CVAP from the 2014. Oh, okay. And in 2020, yeah, we used the um, available data from the ZPF and proved that it's a mirror type variable star. Made a face plot and the JD plot. See that there are uh, a field in VSX, a section which is called catalog data. data. You, you can scroll down and uh, that will oh. give you, oh, here, yeah, yeah, here, we're showing it now. Uh, you can see the infrared colors of the star and that was also already a suggestion that it might be a red variable because uh, the infrared magnitudes were bright and the J minus K was red. So uh, this is something that you have to keep in mind when you find that and you start to see the star colors because the, that will tell you a lot of information about the, the star nature. So it, it was difficult that is, it would be a NOVA with those colors. Yeah, for example, when I'm searching for new variable stars, if I'm searching for longer period ones in survey data, I do the Gaia query for very red stars. And if I search for blue ones, these are the cat twisting ones, I search for um, very blue ones. And also these external links are very useful and they help you to, to see data for, for, from other surveys to easily access it. Uh, personally, I think ZTF should also be here. In, uh, CTF? CTF? Mm. It, is, it, is, it is not here. We will think about that. Um, one question I would have is why this is no more in uh, the catalog data. I, I don't see it anymore in recent submissions. Was it removed? No, it's because it's not automatic. We have to add it and we oh. do it from time to time. So maybe next year we will we'll do another addition oh, of, okay. yes, it's not that you submit a star and that information is automatically added to, to, the, to the page. So yeah. uh, we, we were waiting for Gaia EDR3 to add the, re, the most recent proper motion information too. So probably soon we will make an, an update of all those fields, yeah. Oh yeah, there was even something here that isn't. Uh... Yeah, it's not showing up because uh, that information wasn't added by us, yeah. And something, I think we're nearing the end of the webinar. And I want to say something that's very important. Uh, a lot of uh, stars, variable stars, get specific ones found using uh, EDR3 queries. 
are discovered are discovered long ago and are in the DNS. Like yesterday, I started a search for the uh, ones, the cat rhythmic ones, and out of 50, I think around 10, 50 of them were um, real variables, but known in the TNS and visible only in Gaia EDR3 as the catalog. And uh, Sebastian, do you have any more? So we can give a, a short review of how to, what you should do to, if you find a new variable star. Uh, in short, um, first of all, read the documentation, read the manual, read all the help that you provide, that we provide. So you more or less have a, an idea before, before starting. Um, you need to, you can um, skip the step of combining your data with survey data, but uh, it will be better if you if you can do it because you will find much better periods uh, and information in general. But um, anyway, if you, if you can do it and you only have your observations, you can do it and flag it as a novice discovery. So then um, you have to check that, that the star is not known in VSX. You have all the oceans in the forms. Um, try to stick to the format of the star identifiers. Uh, we have examples there in the forms. Um, provide uh, Gaia EVR3 coordinates um, and try to include all the information you find uh, in databases like uh, VZR, for instance. You may find uh, a spectral type information, especially if the object is bright, because in, in a dwarf novel like the one Gabriel submitted, just a, a while ago, um, for such uh, faint stars, you won't find spectral information. But uh, for for the star like the Delta Scuti that they discovered, uh, there were many spectral uh, types available uh, through VCR. So take a look at all the entries in VCR to provide all the information possible. Um, check colors, check spectral types, because those will help you make a a, a consistent classification. Mm, uh, you will be able to, to have more information to select the proper variability type. Read the variability types document to, to, to be sure that you're classifying your object correctly. Um, and then, okay, you can go ahead, submit it, and uh, we will help you to, if you have to make changes to the submission, editings, if the supporting document is not what we need. For instance, um, Gabriel provided a, a JD plot for this irregular variable. But if the star is a periodic variable, we will need a phase plot. It depends on the star nature. For instance, uh, if the star is a rotational variable, it will usually show a long-term magnitude change. So it, so it will be great if you can provide both a phase plot with the short period, the rotational period, and also a JD plot showing the long-term changes. So it depends on the star, the star type, and um, it will be okay just to submit a face plot, just a JD plot or both. So having these things in mind um, and taking your time to go through all this learning curve is not actually a very difficult process. So, but you have to be patient and, uh, and learn. So that's, a, that's it. We encourage you to, to submit new variable stars to VSX. So I hope that you give it a try. So, uh, what I wanted to show before the um, answering the questions we have. Yeah, we have many. Yeah, one of my variable stars, and I think it's one of the most in more interesting. Like I did a lot of work analyzing it. It, it has the type E L L and B S T, and here I provided two phase plots. One for the E L L variability. And one ELL, ELL stands for ellipsoidal. These are two, this is a binary system with two stars that got a ellipsoidal shape because of the tidal interactions between the two. So you are seeing the, the orbital period there. Uh, another interesting one, now that you're reminding me of the ELL, is this one. Discovered by Marius Dyer and me. 
uh, one of the stars in the trapezium of the Hercules constellation. And in this case, this, like always, eh, this uh, period fits with the spectroscopic period of the rotation of the star. Here and here. And there's a phase plot. Yes, this confirms that uh, the period is okay and that this is an orbital modulation. I think this, this one, since it's a bright one, deserves uh, a V-band classification. Maybe I will observe it in the future. Um, Tess is revealing that uh, most of the naked eye variables, actually the naked eye uh, objects, uh, turn out to be variables. So maybe at the millimagnitude level. So this is a gold mine. You can go through the test data and find a lot of naked eye variables if you want. And that's another interesting project. Yeah, probably even exoplanets. Yeah, probably. We haven't found it yet. Do you want to go on and start answering the questions? Okay, so we have many. Um, let's see. Um, Raul Kraibonu, maybe he, he's from Romania. Yeah. <laughs> from, his, yeah. From, his, from his last name. Um, he asked To discover new variable stars, do we just have to analyze stars that do not exist in catalogs, or are there some special methods that can help us? Do you want to reply to that? Mm, yeah, I can. Uh, I mean, not all of the stars, I mean, most of the variable stars we discover are actually in catalogs. But in catalogs describing the average magnitude, the, um, the position in the sky, but if it's, it's, it's okay if it's there, but it should not be in a variable star catalog. If the, the star is in a variable star catalog, then it's discovered. No. Yes, when you're approached by people who is not related to astronomy and you mention the word discovery, they think that you discovered the star. This is a new star. No, it's not about that because the stars, most of them are already cataloged, especially now that we have Gaia and other very deep surveys. So you are discovering a property of the, property of the star, uh, some feature about his, its behavior, but not actually the star. So this is a difference that you have to keep in mind. We are talking about uh, the light variability here. Like we said in our latest press release from the observatory when we found this variable star, the discovery of the variability of the star. We discovered the variability of the star. Uh, there is an interesting question from John Morrow. The Gaia band G, BP, and RP have been revised in Gaia earlier in December. Will there be different filter designations for varying VSX? We are not planning to do that because maybe uh, with the Gaia DR3 release in a couple of years, there will be again a change in the passbands and every release will have a different passband. So uh, we are not actually planning to do that because those are not standard passbands anyway. So uh, I think it's just to have a rough idea of uh, the range of the variable and things like that. But we will take uh, more precautions or be more, uh, thinking about that if, uh, if it was a, a standard password that's going to be defined and kept for the future. But maybe this one will last just this, this release. So it doesn't make much sense to start adding the uh, year one, year two, year three passwords to the menu because uh, they are not so important in that regard. So uh, I don't think we're going to, to add different Gaia passwords. The difference is not so large anyway. It's the, there is a difference I, I, I checked, but it's not so large. Only I wanted to add to the previous questions. Uh, Raul was asking if there were some special methods that can help us. Well, the methods depends uh, uh, in the database. Some databases uh, allow some type of queries, SQL queries, some no, don't. It depends. I, I even have found thousands of variables with ASAS3, one of the oldest surveys, just uh, using Excel, Excel and its filters. So, uh, and I was able to find those, so it depends. And um, if you talk about 
um, methods of discovering variables. You can use several, for instance, uh, check uh, color information, uh, make uh, cross identifications between different catalogs, spectroscopic catalogs, photometric catalogs. There are a lot of ways. It depends on the variable tab you want to find. Um, well, Gabriel is finding dwarf novas and uh, he uses a different method because he's aimed to find those type of stars. So he looks for objects that are present in Gaia EVR3, but not in other releases. There are a lot of methods that uh, allow you to discover new objects and it depends on what you're looking for and what databases uh, are you using. So yeah, there are a lot of methods. Do you think it's possible to discover a variable star using your naked eyes in 2020? Well, I did it in 1997 with Delta Velorum and in 2000 with Delta Scorpi. So uh, why wouldn't be possible right now? <laughs> the big telescopes are not observing those bright stars. So yeah, I think we may have some eclipse in binary hidden there, maybe with a very long period or maybe another gamma Cassiopeiae star who, which doesn't, which hasn't erupted up to now. We, we don't know, it may happen. Uh, for instance, B stars uh, um, alternate between stages when they are active and they are in quiescence. So uh, we don't know, but uh, yeah, it's, it's possible. You only have to be watching, so yeah. Well, we have uh, more questions. Uh, Bogdan thanks you. Can someone also report any changes he or she observes in our red listed variable stars? For example, the period of the variable? You can reply to this one, you know. Yeah, uh, if you discover any changes, like for example, when I talked about the, um, the ones with no period in the VSX, yes, you can observe them and also use survey data to make a period and calculate the range. Yeah, actually, this is one of our projects, our data mining projects, because um, even when the stars have periods or type, if they come from large surveys like ASAS3 or ASASIN, the information may be wrong, or the types may be just general types like MIS for miscellaneous, bar for variable, so you have to classify them properly, uh, or maybe those surveys have a very low resolution and the ranges and the magnitudes are actually wrong because they are taking uh, into account uh, the combined brightness of several stars in, in the same photometric aperture. So you should uh, search for data on surveys that have a higher resolution and provide a better range, a better amplitude for those stars. So yes, even the stars with data may have wrong data. So uh, there's always room to, to revise information of, of known variables, yeah. Also, then we, okay. You, planet transit and EB through light curve observations. Do you want to answer that? Okay, um, well, with EV, you mean eclipse in binary. Um, we try to avoid that designation to, to just uh, refer to, to the general eclipse in binary zoo, because uh, we have the EA, the album type binaries, with, who are, which are detached binaries, and the AV, which are EV, uh, beta lyra uh, binaries, we have uh, uh, components uh, in contact or semi-detached, but uh, the light curves are different. But uh, yeah, the difference between them is uh, usually the first difference is the amplitude. You won't find uh, a planet causing a, a deep larger than 3% uh, in, in, in the, a drop of more than 3% in the combined brightness. So this is the first thing that you have to note. And the, the light curve shape, shape will be different too. Uh, with eclipse in binaries, you may have a, a V-shaped eclipse, but with planets, which are very small in size compared to the star, you will always have a, a, a total eclipse, actually a transit, a total light curve. You will see um, uh, a light curve showing uh, a lot of time with the same magnitude at minimum because of the eclipse, uh, the, the transit is happening, the, the planet is in front of the star. So the, the, it will take hours for a planet to go in front of the star. So the light curve shape will be, will be different. So amplitude 
and Likert shape uh, are the two key things that will make you differentiate between between the two. But sometimes it's not so easy. And with the CAL project that we mentioned before, it was di difficult because uh, the blended light curves uh, with a lot of contamination from nearby stars were causing the amplitude to be reduced. So if you don't have this in mind, you will interpret that as, okay, this is a very small amplitude eclipse, so this may be a transit, but no, you have to keep that in mind. If the light curve is blended, the amplitude will be reduced. So when you investigate that, you do your research, find a useful uh, high resolution survey, you will be able to see if the dip is actually very small or if it's larger. Um, but you have to keep all those things in mind. So you usually, you are usually able to, to differentiate it, but not all the times. Uh, maybe you have to, to do a deeper research. Here, I can add something. Uh, the test survey, you know, which searches for exoplanets, uh, when they find something, they make an alert and the collaborators can, I can should observe them and send them the data. And when they observe it, they also search for near eclipsing binaries. So there are eclipsing binaries that might contaminate the aperture and make the another star look like a variable. Yeah, it's the same with Kel because they use they use more or less the same uh, aperture and the same resolution. So yeah, you ha they have the, the same problem. So this is great. It's really, really a gold mine, but at the same time, you have to be very careful and check all the field around the star to see if there is a potential contamination source. And you have to rule that out to, to classify the objects properly. When you even found several variability types for the same object, like those examples that you show, the eclipse binary with the uh, SPB variations or your ellipsoidal uh, star with delta scuti pulsations, uh, with tests, you have to keep in mind that you are maybe seeing two stars blended and not actually one star with two variable types. You have to keep that in mind too with tests. So it's great, but you have to be, to be careful and ask for other observations from other observatories to, to confirm that we are actually seeing only one star. So we have more questions. How do you access the survey data in general from Aldrin Gabuja, this one? Is there any programming involved? What do you want to say about that? Uh, sometimes it's hard. I mean, not really hard, but for uh, DTF, there is a link with an SQL query and you have to insert the coordinates into the link. But I already have the link, and it's not like I make the query every time. I just change the coordinate. Yes, it depends on the survey. Each one has a different way to provide their data. So uh, you will have to learn several ways to, to retrieve data. It's not uh, as straightforward as one wants. But we have the VSTAR plugins, which are very helpful for that. We have plugins to download the Kepler data, test data. Uh, all surveys have their plugins. So if you uh, install those plugins in, in BSTAR, you will be able to do it very easily. Um, but uh, it depends on the survey. Some will just offer you a, a CSV file. Uh, others will just show an, show an HTML ML page. Um, so it depends, it depends. So. Uh, it's not actually difficult, but uh, it's very heterogeneous. It's not that uh, everything is the same for each survey. Um, but uh, it's also useful that you remember that you have the external links uh, in VSX. When you want to get data from some survey, you don't need to go to the service page and start a search. It will be really, really time consuming. You better go to VSX, do a positional search, and after the positional search, when you will get probably no result, because if the variable star is actually your discovery, there won't be anything in BSX. Even then, you will have the external links activated, and you can click on those and get to the survey sites and download the data rather quickly. So uh, keep that in mind to avoid wasting time, because 
you will say it will take a lot of time to analyze the data so we don't want to to waste more time just looking for each survey's uh, observations so uh i see one that i, I would like to answer from stefan natas is uh what is the difference between the new star wizard and the new star four the new star wizard is a very simple simplified method to import the variable stars, which tells you everything like uh, it asks, asks you, what is the name? You type it and go to the next page. And what are the coordinates? And you say, and the next page. The new star form is a little bit more complicated for beginners. But for people that are accustomed to this, to this to reporting the variable stars, it's very easy. Okay, um, Jari Batman asked, I was looking for a star and found a new star below the one I was looking for. It wasn't in Estelarium. Two days later, it was still there. I know the right ascension and declination of the new star. How do I check if it's a variable nova? Well, you should go to VSX, type the, the star position. Um, if you go to the VSX uh, search page, and you click on the more button, you will get a coordinate based search. So you will be able to enter the, the position of your object and just check if, if there is something in VSX there or not. Because um, the fact that something isn't in Stellarium doesn't mean that it's not a classified variable because uh, software usually don't use all the information available in the variable style catalogs. So, so um, maybe they have a GCVS version and probably not the latest one. So uh, that is not going to be complete. You need to check with BSX. So always do a positional search uh, using BSX. And if there is some nothing there, well, you just have to review this webinar and follow all the steps and read all the material and well, prepare your submission because you may have found a new, a new variable star. But the advice is not just trust in commercial software. Uh, some people actually uh, names uh, commercial software as a source of magnitudes or things. It's not like that. You have to trace what's actually the source of the magnitudes that the the software used because uh, they may be using Hipparchos, uh, the G GSC, Tyco, any catalog. So those are the sources of the information, not the software. So keep that in mind. But uh, yeah, maybe you find a new variable. Just check uh, with VSX. Oh, interesting question by Ray Trump, Tomlin. Is there an effort to clean up ABSO comparison stars that are found to be variable? Yes. That has been my project for several years. And this is an, an ongoing project. We are now in an advanced stage. We have cleaned up a lot of those. There were many. There still are some. And uh, the thing is that we keep finding new comparison stars that uh, are actually variable. This happens in real time, all the time. When someone, for instance, is observing a, a specific field of a Duar Nova, for instance, a new outburst, and they use uh, the provided comparison stars, they may, found, they may find that one of those are actually variable. So they report that to us and we replace that one for, for a constant comparison star and add that one as a variable star. Oh, oh, of course, if you find one to be variable, you have to report it to VSX too and start the process that we have been mentioning throughout this webinar. So uh, the answer is yes, it has, it has been a, a very important project all the, these years because we try to get rid of all those potential sources of, of problems in the photometry. And at the same time, we are adding more variables to VSX. Um, it's also the case that some variables that are already in VSX are still marked as comparison stars, but uh, we are working on that too. So yeah, there's a lot of effort put on that. We have more questions. Stephen Kirk, 
With the notable exception of alert notices and requested campaigns, is there much point in submitting single observations of variables, given the accuracy of automated sky surveys? Well, it depends on, on the variable star that you're observing. Some surveys are only observing bright stars, uh, sorry, um, faint stars. So if you're observing a eight, nine magnitude star, it's probably no, no survey is really observing it right now. So uh, there's always a point of observing. Oh, Okay, maybe a single observation and never again go back to that field. It, it is not very useful actually, unless you have a very well calibrated equip equipment because um, it's better if you are able to provide a, uh, an actual light curve uh, to spend some time on your star uh, instead of just a single point because that suggests that uh, if you only report one point, it, it, it looks like you're only going to add more stars to your total numbers and that's not the point actually. So um, yeah, it's, it's more useful if you follow campaigns and alerts, but uh, every observation for every variable star is useful um, in the sense that uh, you will be adding observations and information about that star, but not just one visit and that's it. Um, I think, um, is better to, to keep observing the same star. It's more useful if, if you select uh, a number of stars and con consistently observe them, that if you observe thousands of stars and providing only just one data point, especially for visual observers, um, because uh, the precision won't be so, so high and um, comparison between different uh, detectors on even, even different uh, observers uh, won't be easy if you just provide one point. So, uh, but there is always room for, for observations from, from our observers. It's not that as automatic sky services are going to do everything and that's it, no. Um, even the cadence of the service is different and some surveys may be observing the sky only once every two or three nights or, or more. So, um, there is always room for someone to discover something when the service are not observing. So uh, it's, it's, it's always useful. Well, Michael from the sequence team says, yeah, we have to inform the sequence team. Yes, if you, some, if you find some variable comparison star, the, the, the first step is to, for, to submit a report to the sequence team, we have the chat tool um you can go to you can use that tool and submit a report reporting that uh, the comparison star and use the, the number for instance uh, 114 it turns out to be variable and yeah report that and and the sequence team will will inform me and I will check and see that information but if it's a new variable we encourage you to submit it to be assigned to on your own, not just inform us. It will be good to, for you also to, to, to see uh, your results in BSX and you will learn something new. It's, it's a good experience. Gabriel has told, about, told, uh, told you about that, so. Um, do you see some more questions here or? No, looks like we answered them all. If you have any more questions, uh, write them now. Uh, I have one for you. Okay. Uh, when you want to add a star, how do you do it? Do you submit it and then accept it yourself? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. There's no other way. This is a privilege that I have, but um, I am usually not discovering much these days. Uh, I have a, a lot from the past that I have to work on, but when you spend all the time reviewing stars, so when the day comes to an end, you only want to do other things. <laughs> but so my own stars are there hidden in my hard disk, sleeping. But um, yeah, um, I also have many that are not actually more interesting to me, like red variables. So I don't know what I'm going to do about that. So, um, but yes, um, I think we have covered all. Yeah. Mm. 
yeah. So I hope uh, you have enjoyed this. I, I enjoyed it. It was really good to to see this kind of of webinar to know you, your experience, the experience from someone who is actually using VSX and discovering new things. And um, I think it's it's really useful to to get the input from someone who who is doing it himself. So I think people will will have appreciated that. So yeah, thank thanks, you. thanks to Gabriel. Thank you. So, so maybe more people will start doing it. We hope so. Yeah, we hope so. Um, yeah. So if you have if you have more questions and we haven't covered uh, all your doubts here, or all the aspects of variable star because it's impossible, um, just contact us. You can send an email to bsx uh, at uh, abso.org um, and we will reply and we will help you. And so we encourage you to do that. Just uh, jump in this uh, fascinating world of variable star observing. So thanks, Gabriel. Thank you too. So should we stop the webinar, right? Yep. So that's it. Thanks everyone for having been here and be part of this this webinar. Yeah. See you. Time. See you. Goodbye. Bye bye.